Okay, so we are WCP07. Uh, we worked on the IBM printer driver. Uh, I am Nick Heckman, I'm an EE, and I'm the team lead. John Weissman, I'm a computer engineer. Lenny Almost Guy, I'm a computer engineer. And that guy in the back is the printer. Uh, he's the biggest one in the photo. Um, so, what we worked on, the Center for Technology and Innovation is a local museum, and they got a hold of an IBM 1403 N1 printer. Uh, it's a big uh, line printer built like uh, mid to early 60s. Um, I haven't gotten them to nail down that date for me, but mid to early 60s. Uh, printed at 1100 lines a minute. That's real fast. Uh, I believe at the time it was the fastest. Um, so they got a hold of one of those, and it doesn't work. Uh, it almost works, and they're in the process of refurbishing it. And while they were doing that, they put together a project uh, where we would redevelop a controller for the printer. The original controller was a rack of hardware that no longer exists and it needed essentially to be redeveloped. And that was our task. Um, they uh, got the help of the Binghamton uh, IEEE section uh, to sponsor the program and they worked together to get uh, the Triple Cities Makerspace and uh, WCP uh, sort of took two halves of the project. Uh, WCP was developing software for that controller at the same time that Triple Cities Makerspace was going to take what was developed by WCP last year, har hardware-wise, and scale it up to a larger uh, controller. Um, so this is sort of where we fit in the whole scope of that project. Um, we take uh, signals from a user. Uh, we have a user interface that takes uh, controls from a user and uh, converts it to pulses that are usable by the printer, and there's some logic and amplifiers that drive the printer um, and, and have it print the page. And at the same time, we're also taking signals back from the printer to sync with them. Um, here's sort of a close-up of that. Um, we developed a host PC application, that's for taking user inputs, and it also gives back some status information to the user. Uh, we also developed uh, an embedded solution on this timing control board. That takes uh, those inputs from the host PC, and it develops timing information that's conveyed to these uh, logic and drivers, that's Triple City Makerspace, what they're up, uh, scaling up. And while we're doing that, we're also taking sync pulses from the printer, and we're using those to sort of maintain synchronization with it, which uh, these two will talk to you a little bit more about in a second. Uh, we also had uh, a stretch goal of implementing a hardware safety interlock device, and the point of that device is to remove power from the printer in the case of any hardware fault, sort of to protect the hardware. Um, so, just uh, again to summarize what our task was, there was a whole rack of these SMS cards that did this task, and you can see, I mean, just this is one, and that's what part of the rack would look like. And we had to take that and sort of put it all on this device, right? So it's a very, um, you know, we had to take a lot of parallel processing and put it onto a single microcontroller. So uh, we needed to be able to fire hammers inside that printer as often as every five microseconds, which made this a real-time processing task. And at the same time we were doing that, we also needed to be able to establish and maintain synchronization with the printer. Um, so uh, with that, I will hand it off to John to kind of tell you more about what that means. Okay. So here we have a diagram of the printer train. We actually have one up here with us, if anyone wants to see it after the presentation. Um, on the printer train here, there are metal slugs. Each slug has three characters on it, and the characters are moving around the train at 206 inches per minute. Um, so in front of the slugs is a ribbon with ink on it, and then in front of that is the paper on which we're printing, and these hammers. So when the hammers fire, they hit the paper into the ribbon, into the slug, which fires the correct character at the desired location. Um, so as this is moving around, we have the drive gear here, here and the idler gear here, here, and these generate pulses that allow us to maintain synchronization with the printer. So the idler gear here generates what we call the universal character set, or UCS pulse, about every 29 um, milliseconds, and the drive gear generates the print subscan, or PSS pulse, about every 243 microseconds. After 144 PSS pulses, we get what we call the extra pulse. When the extra pulse is coincident with the UCS pulse, it uh, generates what we call the home pulse. When our timing control subsystem receives the home pulse, we know that the print train is in a specific location. And that's how we maintain synchronization with the print train. <coughs> so some of the key requirements for this project. 
on the project, we had 65 requirements, and some of the most important ones were obviously the time. We want to be able to fire hammers up to every five microseconds, and we want to be able to do that as we maintain synchronization with the printer. We also uh, want to be able to receive input from a user in order to print, and then display any sort of relevant status information back to that user about the print. We also want to be able to operate the printer at 1100 lines per minute. As Nick said, this was the original rated capability of the printer, and in refurbishing it, we want to bring it back up to what it was originally capable of. We had a stretch goal of creating a, a hardware safety interlock that would remove 60 volt power from the printer in the event of any hardware failure in order to um, you know, keep the hardware safe, it's finished hardware. So just to touch on some of the interfaces that our time control board has, it interfaces with the host PC over a USB connection. Um, there's, so it's a serial connection going both ways. Um, and with the uh, dryer hardware, we have a um, synchronous parallel uh, interface. Um, and over this interface, we uh, send certain commands, which we have a table of here. And you know, in order, when we send these commands, we want the driver hardware to fire hammers. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about the host PC software a little bit. Um, host PC software accepts input from the user and sends that eventually to the printer and gets any sort of status information back. Um, so I'm just going to run you through the forms we have here. This is the home form. It's the first form that comes up when a user starts the program. This allows the user to navigate between the rest of the forms of the program. One of the important things to note here is the status label, which, dis which displays the status that I've been talking about. Um, so here's the connections form. This form allows the user over here to uh, establish a connection with our time and control board. And then over here, they can initiate a power on reset command to the board in order to reset it to a known state. Here's the configurations form. This allows users to edit configuration files and send those files to the time and control board. It contains important information about the operation of the printer, specifically here the print train image. A user can enter specifically what characters are around the print train, and that's important because there are many different configurations of print trains. They don't necessarily have the same characters or in the same order. We want that to be interchangeable. Again, here you see the status label, which displays the status information. Uh, on the print form, a user can enter characters at a specified position. They can also enter lines of text and a specific text file that they want to print. They can also print any number of empty lines that they want. Again, the status label is on this form as well. And I'll hand it over to Elena to talk about the time scales of our project. All right. So John just told you about the user interface and the user will probably put commands on the scale of seconds. That's the human time scale. And if they want to print something, a print line has to take about 55 milliseconds in order to hit that 1100 line per minute requirement. In order to print a line that quickly, we have to characterize the pulses, which John talked about, the UCS pulse and the PSS pulse, which occur on a scale of microseconds. So we have to be able to catch those and then within those do our 5 microsecond interlude. So to implement our tiny control board, we used a chip-fit Wi-Fi. This dev board uses a PIC32 microcontroller, and we chose it because of its speed. With two, it's got a 200 megahertz clock, and we figured that was quick enough for us to fulfill our 5 microsecond interlude. The architecture of the software uses a single external interrupt. We, this single external interrupt is how we maintain synchronization with the printer. We figured we didn't need both pulses as interrupts because just the PSS was enough to characterize its behavior. The PSS interrupt is connected to the PSS pulse, so it occurs about every 243 microseconds or quicker if it's an extra pulse. And on every PSS interrupt, we check what kind of pulse it is. It can be either a normal, extra, or home pulse, and depending on that, we change our start hammer and start character. Here we see a bunch of PSS interrupts. Those are about 2.3 microseconds apart, and then over here is one of the extra pulses. As you can see, it's a tiny pulse. And here is the print text algorithm. This is the heart of the tiny control board. This is the, this is its most important capability. And before we get text from the host PC, and then we, we set which hammers and which characters we need to fire. And then we drop into our inner loop in order to tell when we can 
fire a hammer in order to get the correct character in the correct position. Yep. This will take multiple PSS pulses because different hammers align with different characters on every pulse. So there are 44 <coughs> possible char critical characters and positions per PSS pulse. And if it's not in that one, you have to drop back up and go through the entire loop. So after all the required positions have been filled with the correct characters, we space the correct amount of time and then get the next line required. And this is just to maintain that 55 milliseconds requirement. And this oscilloscope reading shows the PSS pulse and then following it, a series of hammer fire signals. This was generated using a line which fires every hammer as soon as a critical character appears at it. So these are every five microseconds, so we fulfill that five microsecond interval requirement. And uh, Nick will tell you about the hardware state panel. So the hardware safety interlock, what it needed to do is remove power from the printer anytime a detectable hardware fault occurred. So we implemented that by putting a contactor inside the rack that would uh, that we controlled the ground to, the coil of that contactor. Um, so we controlled the, the ground to the coil of that contactor and we could remove it to remove power. Um, the majority of the detectable faults were uh, detectable via uh, switches that would open inside the printer in an unsafe condition. For example, you open the door and there's something spinning in there that's unsafe, it detects it. So we put those in series with this ground path we can break. Um, we did have to implement a uh, PCB uh, for some of the other more complex things. Um, for example, there's a software enable that we needed to implement from the hammer driver and the carriage driver. Uh, but also there's, we had this requirement to uh, remove power if we were trying to move paper at the same time we had a hammer thrown, right? But that's complicated because that's supposed to happen for the first 1,200 microseconds that you're moving paper. You're supposed to have a hammer thrown still. So what we had to end up doing was somehow ignore that first coincidence but detect any longer coincidence. So we did that with a single shot. We ignore any two milliseconds of coincidence. Uh, and that added a little complication that we needed to um, uh, throw a second single shot to make sure that the contactor actually opens. So this was implemented on a uh, on protoboard and delivered to the client. So, um, so what you see here on the left is the chip kit I already showed you. On the right is one of the hammer driver cards. Um, what in this specific setup, this was the final version of the test setup. Um, off to the right, you can't see it. We're actually throwing an actual hammer. Um, and on the left, you can't see it. The printer is giving us sync pulses. So this is in the complete system. We're throwing a hammer. Uh, and this USB cable off here is running to the host PC with the host PC application running. So we tested this fully assembled and throwing a hammer and looked at it and it was working correctly. But before we could get to that point, we had to simulate all these things. This was like, uh, testing was like multi-step. It was, we had to build a simulator for the PC, for the uh, printer pulses, because we didn't have, we, we couldn't get them all the time. So we had to build a simulator here, which was implemented on an Arduino. We built a detector before we had hammer driver cards. That was implemented on Arduino. Uh, we had to power all these things up separately and integrate them all separately before we could get to this point. Um, so the results of our testing, um, we were, we, we had, let's say, uh, an 18 page uh, test procedure that we were able to go through and we hit all of our tests. Um, so we successfully tested uh, and hit every requirement. Um, what we were unable to hit during tests uh, was uh, the interlock uh, tests, uh, which was a stretch goal because the rack isn't completely wired, so we couldn't integrate it with the rack at the time that we were performing testing. Uh, so we came in well under budget. Um, we decided to buy a spare chip kit uh, in case something happened at the first, but other than that, we came in well under budget. Uh, we've hit all of our project milestones from the beginning. Uh, we got one at 99%, that's this one, so we got like five minutes left, probably less. Uh, we intend to uh, continue to support the client. Their integration is still ongoing. They're still integrating all the hardware that they're refurbishing and that Triple Cities Makerspace is still, uh, well, has developed and they're assembling and they need to integrate all that. And we uh, intend to continue support during that process. Um, so some of the results we're happy uh, with, you could call them achievements, is uh, 
we were able to maintain sync, uh, sync with that print train and, uh, and consistently. And we were very happy with that because that was the task we were afraid of not being able to do consistently. So we were real happy with that one. Uh, the host PC software we developed, we think that's really user friendly. Um, we're happy with that. And we were able to integrate that with the timing controller software and send commands nicely. Again, very consistently. So we're happy with that. Um, the timing control software does everything it needs to do. Our print algorithm has been proven out. And uh, we delivered a prototype of that hardware safety interlocking. We did do unit testing on it, and we're happy with it. Uh, what we need to do moving forward, uh, of course, like I said, the assembly and integration is ongoing at, um, at CTNI. Um, that hardware safety interlock needs to be tested. Uh, parts exist to build a, back, a uh, spare of that. That might need to happen pending test. Uh, there are some sort of timing requirements. Uh, for example, space timings that are specify a nominal value, but need to be fine-tuned before the final implementation. So those can't happen until the printer is fully assembled. So those still need to be done. And then on the 16th, we got a soiree at the museum. We're going to demonstrate, demonstrate print capability for some of CTNI's sponsors. So we're excited for that. Uh, we would like to thank uh, the Bennington uh, IEEE, uh, especially Tommy Lamb. They were our project sponsor. Uh, we'd also like to thank Triple Cities Makerspace. It said uh, neither of them made it tonight, but Evil Jim and uh, Eric Adler, a uh, huge technical help throughout the project. Uh, CTNI, uh, I'm going to read off the people who are here, are Susan Sherwood, uh, Art Law, and Tom Shappy. Uh, the rest of these guys on this list, again, all huge help. Uh, a lot of those guys worked on the design of the printer originally in the 60s, and they were just a huge technical help throughout this project. And of course, I'd like to thank Jack Maynard, who was our uh, faculty advisor here. Uh, questions? So since you have half your budget left, yeah. um, what would you, looking back now, what would you add on mm -hmm. to make use of that? Well, we, yeah, I would like to, well, we thought we were going to be able to test and maybe print a PCB for that interlock and actually order a nice one. Uh, as it is, it's implemented on protoboard, which was $5. If we had ordered it, I would have ordered it with spares. That might have been another hundred on top of the budget. I would have been happy to be able to do that and actually provide a finished product to the client. Uh, other than that, I don't know. I'm pretty happy with the implementation, really. Um, yeah, right. Get more tickets. Um, yeah, we were trying to find ways actually to uh, to justify using more of that budget to help them because they have things ongoing, but we couldn't really justify using it for their tasks. Uh, anything else? Yeah. What do you enjoy the most, you know? What's that? What do you enjoy the most, working on like 60s technology and like how do you correlate that 60s, like 60s technology with like whatever we're doing right now, like the modern, like the modern printer and everything? How do you correlate with that like, that like almost like 60s old technology to like what we're doing right now? Uh, how do the two relate? Um, yeah, I mean, like, how do you compare those two technologies? <coughs> okay. Um, <laughs> we need to put the we have the, that those logic cameras that we had the those logic drivers and the amplifier card. We needed those to translate from whatever voltages that printer operated at to our voltages. And there, there's no firmware on that printer. It's just here are some signals. Please give me some way to fire these cameras. There's no code on there at all. Yeah. Have to say I'm take these signals and make meaningful tiny. Being an electrical guy, one of the things that really stood out to me is if you look at this old technology, they always have like plus 20 volts, minus 20 volts, plus 12, minus 12, plus 8, minus, like all these different voltages, whereas nowadays you try to have a single supply that provides maybe, you know, 12, minus 12, right? So there was, I think, a simplification there where you're just drawing from more standard supplies, right? There's standardization. Plus, if you look at the older technology, they did everything in parallel hardware. Whereas, of course, nowadays you try to implement it on a microprocessor as we did, so that was a big, uh, weird cultural difference. Everything there is one of these, <coughs> whereas for me it would be a function. So, so that picture you showed with the original card, there yeah. was a whole rack of them. So all of those got replaced by the one board with the microprocessor? Well, that, that isn't really um, y yes and no. Uh, their control stuff was done in parallel hardware. Um, but what they also had were some, uh, the, the printer itself uses um, solenoid-driven hammers. 
and those have high power drivers, right? Which of course couldn't be done in software. So a lot of what Triple City's makerspace is implementing is actually those uh, high power drivers, which is there is going to be a, a chassis like like this big or something. If that's a square, so it's still like a, a like a significant scaling down in terms of size, but. Um, again, there was a lot of that hardware that was done at what you would call like an FP, what you would do in an FPGA or something today. It was a whole bunch of gates that was just right here. Uh, do you remember how many um, uh, cards are put together by Tripsidus Makerspace and some of the locking people? They're, they're eight hammers, that right? Eight hammers for, for new yeah, card? Yeah, right. 132 hammers, eight per card. I think that comes to 17 cards with some spares. Plus, they were able to, with their new car design, they were able to just write a different software to move the paper to, to drive the carriage. So that's an 18th car. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay.